thank you for being here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that I'm very interested in zero point energy research. Um, it, not only because it's a promising new field of uh, energy, a source of energy, but the, the science underlying um, the zero point energy fields is also a new uh, science in physics, uh, looking at the universe and the laws governing it uh, differently. And, uh, you know, some quantum paradoxes are better explained, more convincingly explained. Uh, and it, it is sort of the first attempt at unifying uh, the laws that govern our universe. So uh, that's why, you know, I, that's where my interest uh, comes in. And of course, it, it's, it's a bonus that it's a source of abundant, um, cheap energy. Um, I'm going to talk about it in three parts, just uh, some background initially, some concepts in zero point energy science, um, how we measure it, then going to the principles, basic principles that govern um, uh, and point us to how we can extract it, uh, you extract usable force from it, and then moving on to some technology ideas, uh, which are still primitive, but um, are surely good developments that have happened uh, already so far. So what is it? You might have heard different names, but essentially it is the, the, the fundamental uh, energy field uh, which from which uh, elementary particles and other energy fields uh, are thought to derive themselves. And um, you can think about it in, in terms of the basic energy of the vacuum, uh, which is everywhere, as you know. Um, and it, it's, it's the, the underlying jitter that is still there once you remove all other uh, electromagnetic radiation, matter, and all forms of energy. Um, temperature even. And there are, you know, some names uh, in scientific literature, in, in other literatures, vacuum energy, quantum form, gravity field energy. And uh, I, I believe the term was introduced somewhere around 1916 by Max Planck, where, when, when um, uh, quantum mechanics introduced, well, this, this term was introduced into quantum mechanics um, to explain the, the background energy of a system. And it is also, uh, it has a cosmological um, implication. It is supposed to be, it is thought of as the, uh, you know, the, the element that contributes to the positive uh, um, value of the cosmological constant, which is responsible for the expansion of the, of the universe and the space between the galaxies and so on. And so uh, for physicists, uh, they sometimes they're synonymous, the cosmological constant and zero point energy. Um, we know of um, the underlying jitter of the vacuum. When you observe vacuum, uh, there are, you know, um, pairs, positron, positron, electron pairs coming in and going out uh, at very fast speeds, just appearing and disappearing uh, from the zero point energy field. Um, which, is, which is a known phenomena. And uh, that is how uh, it is observed unless uh, conditions are created to cohere with it and uh, make it manifest. Um, there are lots of bases in the literature uh, for zero point energy uh, explaining different things, the, how the quantum effects arise, um, how the hydrogen atom is stabilized, uh, because uh, it has a, a, a zero point energy to it, um, uh, how it can become an energy source in the future, uh, even gravity, uh, the gravitational effects in, in, in the universe, how they can be traced potentially to the zero point field and uh, inertia and so on. So it, it is actually a well studied from different angles uh, in physics theoretical and experimental both. So how much do we have? Um, to quote from one of the most famous physics textbooks going around today, gravitation, um, present day quantum field theory gets rid 
by a renormalization process of an energy um, in the vacuum, which would be infinite if we did not renormalize it. Uh, what is renormalization? Uh, when physicists are faced with infinities, they really don't like them. No one does because you can't really conceive of it. Um, so they, they chop it down using fundamental constants, um, such as in this case, it's Planck's constants that uh, they used to renormalize uh, zero point energy. Um, it, it's one thing if the, uh, the infinity is very, very small. There are two types of infinities. Uh, the very, very, very small, uh, infinitesimally small uh, uh, values, which can be ignored because they're negligible. But when they're very, very large, uh, they're also called nasty infinities. And when nasty infinities show up, you have to renormalize them. You just can't ignore them. So they get renormalized. In, in zero point energy's case, uh, the way they renormalize it is they say, okay, how can we make it finite? So what they did was uh, took, imagine one uh, cubic centimeter of space and try to fit in these little Planck's distances, which are very small, 10 to the minus 33 uh, centimeters, which is, it's supposedly the smallest thing the universe is supposed to do. Okay. Um, and see how many of these we can fit in into one centimeter cube of space, and then we can have a finite number. And each of these uh, Planck's distances have a specific uh, mass, which is 10 to the minus five grams. So you add all that up, what do you get? Turns out it is still ridiculously dense. 10 to the 94 grams, that's how much energy uh, a centimeter cube of space, empty space, vacuum would have. Uh, and, to, and to compare how much that is, uh, if you took all the observable mass of the universe, all of it, all galaxies, stars, everything, squished it down into one centimeter cube of space, it would still be 10 to the 55 grams. Uh, I should have put the number there. It's, it, it's still 39 orders of magnitude less than the energy of vacuum. So it, it's mind boggling. That's how dense it is. This is, I mean, this is if you, this is renormalized. This is chopped off. So it gives you, I mean, there, there are different ways. There are some in different interpretations of this. But in any case, uh, no matter what interpretation you use, you end up with a very large number for the density of vacuum. <clears throat> um, so if. It is, thought to, uh, it is thought that all elementary particles and energies uh, and radiation derive themselves from this field. Um, and vacuum is obviously everywhere, between stars, between galaxies. 99.999% uh, of atoms are vacuum. So it's pretty much everywhere that you can imagine. Um, and uh, these things are deriving, uh, you know, manif uh, matter manifests from it then there must be a law that can show the relationship between the smallest of things and the largest of things, right? Um, if it were true, if they all had one source. And uh, sure enough, uh, two scientists looking at this, um, Nassim and Elizabeth, uh, derived a simple relationship. You take the energy of a system in hertz and plot it against diameter of that system or the radius of that system. You start with um, the universe itself. Now we can estimate the observable universe and the mass it has and the radius it has. Um, plot that. Uh, you plot the galactic, the supergalactic uh, clusters and the galaxies. Uh, stars and stun uh, the sun or any stellar object and they all neatly line up. So there is obviously some sort of a relationship there. Uh, however, the most fascinating thing is that they plot an atom. This is an atom. That's a very, very big jump. Lots of orders of magnitude going from a star to an atom. And it again neatly lines up. All the way to, this is the Big Bang. This is the Planck's distance, 10 to the minus 33. So all the way from minus 33 
to, to the size of the universe. Um, clearly there is. Clearly you, you can see that the vacuum is dividing itself in, in a very specific relationship. Um, uh, another interesting fact, you plot microtubules found in uh, cells of uh, um, uh, eukaryotic cells, or any of the cells, I think, um, and it lines up too. That's good to know that we are also a part of the plan. Um, and uh, another supportive fact is, I'm sorry, this is not, a, I should have cleaned the slide up a little bit, but you can see that when you divide the, um, when you get ratios of these divisions, you, you see the, uh, you see here the um, phi ratios come up. Phi ratios uh, you might know are everywhere in nature, right? It's strewn across uh, different, uh, different systems in nature, and so it's good to see them here. It, it's, it sort of is, it supports the fact that you know nature is um, uh, there are there are laws which are being followed here and uh, specific uh, divisions of vacuum which manifests them. Or you can think of uh, sp um, creating um, sort of border um, uh, conditions which manifest themselves as uh, matter. Uh, so, sort of in summary, for vacuum, it, it is everywhere from the tiniest thing you can imagine to the largest thing you can imagine. It is infinitely dense, or at least very, very dense. Uh, and uh, it, it, it follows this specific relationships, creating boundary conditions for, for things to appear uh, to us as they do. So moving on to what, then uh, what could be the principles to, uh, for us to connect um, and cohere with this uh, zero point field to derive usable force from it. You know, it, it, is, it is infinitely dense, but it, it appears to us as vacuum because infinitely different vectors going in different directions cancel each other out, and, and you, what you see is empty space. So then how can, it, and if you want to derive uh, or uh, extract force out of it, it has to, uh, the, some self-organization has to happen. But can, can self-organization happen in, in uh, the vacuum? Because, you know, the en entropic law says that everything, uh, a system decays into randomness because of entropy. Um, but good news is that it does happen, and we only need to look at life because life doesn't follow the entropic principle. It, it, it is, goes from less complicated systems to more complicated systems, spontaneous uh, uh, um, self-organization. And, so, and, and there are other people who spoke about it. Uh, Prigogine w got the Nobel Prize for showing uh, some of his work, uh, you know, which is exactly about order from chaos and how, um, how it can happen um, what are the laws governing such systems and so on. I think it was 77 when he got his Nobel Prize for this. And there are other people who have said, who, who have dealt with uh, the theory from different um, angles. Um, Brian Greene, I don't, oh, sorry, I don't know if um, you know of the, the, the science festival, uh, which happens in New York every, every year now. Um, Brian Green is a professor at Columbia University who has written on string theory and other things. He's a theoretical physicist. Um, I really like uh, Lawlin's work. He also got the Nobel Prize for showing that um, everything, including laws of physics themselves, arise from collectives. And so order out of chaos definitely happens under certain conditions. Um, Lisa Randall is, uh, has also written some very uh, in, in layman terms, some very interesting uh, work, um, and, and I, she continues at Harvard. I think she th teaches uh, theoretical physics there. So um, we have our conditions for extracting zero-point energy, which is, it seems, highly nonlinear systems. And uh, that is not very surprising, because most systems in nature are nonlinear. Um, and abruptly, when you drive the nonlinear system far away from equilibrium, uh, you see these uh, effects of cohering the energy uh, manifesting themselves. And you maximize this in, uh, using 
um, charged particles, either ions, uh, plasmas, and, and there is, yes? Uh, let's just, I'll use extraction from now on, is that, or because it, it's a form of resonance. Uh, uh, so creating some form of resonance so that the energy can uh, be extracted. Does, does that make sense? Um, <laughs> let's just say extracted. Okay. Uh, uh, we can have a discussion on coherence, but I think that might be diverging from. Um, it's essentially, in simplistic terms, uh, when, you, when there is an energy available, usually energy is available in, in waveforms, and waves have, uh, you know, characteristics like resonance. So if you create resonance with it, then and that you open up uh, possibilities of that uh, extracting it, which, which is what I'm referring to as cohering, coherence. Right. Um, usually, we, we see systems in the nature uh, in, in perpetual motion, like electrons in galaxies, uh, you know, planets. Um, electrons particularly are in, in equilibrium with the zero-point field, and that's why we don't see any uh, excessive energy in this case because the system is in equilibrium with the zero-point field. We don't get any excess energy. Um, however, the, the nuclei of uh, pretty much all elements, when, when it is de-shielded from the electron, so you can imagine just a positively charged nucleus, the zero-point energy fields all converge towards the center. And so when you, when you abruptly m force it to move, you start uh, interacting with the zero-point field. This is one of the, so the basic principles. It, it can trigger self-organization in that field and thereby allowing us to use it. Um, it it's been observed that the uh, zero-point field, um, the energy flux is bent. I mean, the, the flatland slot here is, you can imagine that as our 3D space. And because the zero-point flux is orthogonal to the 3D uh, space, Orthogonal means just at right angles to the entire three-dimensional space. Um, and, and when you move uh, ions uh, or a nuclei, if you, if you like, um, abruptly, you, you see um, them bending the zero-point field. And this has been observed and uh, has been called different uh, names, the phenomena. Um, coherent vacuum states uh, in electrodynamics. This is, and they, they observe that when that in, ion, in plasma ions collide, they sh give off a lot of excessive energy, and uh, that cannot be explained in any other way but coming from uh, coherence with zero point energy. And um, also, when in, in plasma systems, plasma is basically just charged gas, if you don't know what plasma is, just a highly charged gas. It could be in inert gas, it could be air, it could be any uh, gas for our arguments here. It's just a highly charged form of a gas. Uh, you, you induce the movement in, in plasmas using acoustic uh, waves, for example, you see coherence with zero-point energy. Well, at least you see um, self-organization occurring, which, which is uh, pointing to the f uh, coherence with zero-point energy. And you see uh, large, uh, ra you know, energy absorption and frequ uh, frequ uh, frequency spikes, and lots of electrons, and uh, unexplained heating. And uh, earlier we did not have any idea what this was, but now the, the theories are slowly uh, explaining it through uh, zero-point energy um, coherence. <clears throat> and uh, experimental evidence has also been seen in form of uh, the Casimir effect. Uh, I don't know if people have heard about the Casimir effect, but it, uh, Casimir also got the Nobel Prize um, for this. Uh, one of his earlier works was that if, if zero-point energy really existed, then it should be able to manifest itself uh, in, in such a way that when you bring two plates together in vacuum, if they're close enough, um, such that all the, the high wavelengths are excluded from within uh, the, the distance within the plates, then those uh, wavelengths will push them together. Uh, proving the presence of the energy field. 
and, and now we, it, we can see it. We can see it in ele electrodynamic systems, in physical systems uh, such as this. Uh, it has been published. So th that is one uh, sort of uh, experimental evidence that is widely now seen. <coughs> um, which brings us to what, are, what is happening in terms of technology uh, that can allow us to use this, to use the energy from the field. And most of it is based on um, energetic charge clusters um, in plasmas and water. So far, these are the two systems which have really um, shown promise. Um, talking about uh, charged water clusters, first, um, Brown's gas was where they were observed initially. Brown's gas was just uh, uh, an electro electrolytic gas for which Yul Brown, a scientist, uh, applied um, for a patent, I think, in sometime in the 70s. He was trying to make a gas for welding, essentially he was just trying to split water into hydrogen and oxygen and use the hydrogen for um, welding. Um, and that is mostly what comes off uh, when you do electrolysis of water in, in this way. Um, but there is an anomalous gas which uh, uh, under certain conditions is produced more and you can, you can push the uh, quantities of this gas with conditions which we'll just see. Um, but essentially, that gas, the uh, gas which shows anomalous uh, behavior, um, is, is a new form of water, if you like. It, it's not water vapor. It's, it's water vapor with uh, a lot of extra electrons. Um, uh, they call it electrically expanded water, or a scientist in Japan uh, named it after himself when he observed it, and Stuart, Stuart and Gurley also observed it around at the same time. Uh, and the anomalous characteristics are, one of them is that it's a cool flame around 130 degrees, which is just above the boiling point of water. Uh, you can quickly sort of move your hand through it. Um, uh, and yet, it, it doesn't boil water, but it vaporizes tungsten. Uh, the degree for the, the temperature at which that happens is at 10,000 degrees Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit, sorry, uh, about 6,000 degrees Celsius, which, is, uh, which cannot be explained um, with hydrogen. Hydrogen um, cannot give us so much energy. Um, you see there, the, in spite of being, in spite of these temperature characteristics, uh, it gives us uh, results which none of these other welding torches uh, can provide. So sure, there is uh, an uh, unexplained behavior going on there, and uh, theories are now, uh, we are seeing some form of experimental evidence for me mechanisms where, okay, I'm, I'll be asked to speak up, um, where uh, it's zero point energy might have uh, something to do with this. These are the anomalies. It can even cut through metal and ceramics and wood. And there are, there are videos out there. Uh, you can probably Google it and you can see the videos. Um, as I said, it, 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 hydrogen cannot um, be the source of the energy. It cannot give us more energy than what we already put in. So for electrolysis, you, you, the energy that you put into split water cannot be recovered by hydrogen, burning hydrogen. So that would, that would uh, violate thermodynamics. So it is, it's definitely not that. Um, you can see something called the balloon test uh, with Brown's gas or with the secondary gas. Uh, if, you, if you fill a balloon up with the gas coming off from the electrolysis, um, let it stand for a while because hydrogen escapes easily. Um, and then uh, you can see, you can, you can light it, the gas, if you've got enough of it there. Um, so what is going on? Uh, Chris Ekman was, is one of the scientists who has done, has started doing some, some experiments on it to, to see what, what, what is the secondary gas. Um, it's not diatomic hydrogen, it's not monoatomic hydrogen, um, it's just water vapor with excess electrons. And he, he's managed to actually uh, see how much, uh, what, is, what is the ratio, how many extra electrons we have and where, where do they go and so on. Uh, and he's also confirmed uh, the flame temperature using uh, characteristics. 
Um, and this is, this is what he theorizes, that it's, it's a form of water which is linear. So n this is normally the symmetry, or rather the uh, geometry of a water molecule, uh, which only has four electrons. But this form, when it is linear, has two extra electrons far out in the d orbitals, um, essentially very far from the, the nucleus of the molecule. Um, and it's, it's not very stable as it is, but it forms uh, structures which stabilize it. Under certain conditions, electrostatic uh, forces will, will form a ring out of it, the positive and negative um, atoms. And if it is under certain sizes, it, it is stable. So it will stay like that for, for a very long time, and it will keep the energy um, uh, stored inside it for a long time. And um, it can form meta structures. So this, this ring uh, of the charged water gas clusters and uh, this black line you can imagine as the electrons which are far away in a, in a sort of a non-localized cloud around it. And it attracts positively charged hydrogen atoms and it forms these stable large structures. And it can form, uh, it can stabilize through forming long um, sort of snake-like structures with positive charge on one side and negative charge on one side and it goes and it support it, so it's it, it polarizes essentially and when it polarizes it, it, it can form a ring again and more meta structures evolve and this uh, form when uh, ignited or sparked will convert into a plasmoid which is the geometry which actually coheres the maximum uh, starts cohering with the zero point field. And what, what the uh, phenomenon that causes these, uh, the, you know, uh, the way these structures start making themselves is through a process called cavitation, which is observed. Cavitation is nothing but bubbling in, in simple terms, but uh, normally when, you, when there are bubbles, uh, like for example, when you boil water, there are, you see the bubbles coming off. That is also a form of cavitation, but in, in this case, the, the water, uh, rather the bubble, collapses uh, asymmetrically and it collapses near a surface and it collapses with such uh, a, a vigorous force and pressure that it makes these charged clusters, it starts making these charged clusters through, um, uh, oh, I think that, that I, I'll explain more on how these charged clusters come along, but cavitation is how they, they um, happen. And many uh, electrolyzers cavitate the water uh, without uh, you know, people realizing it. But now uh, uh, many um, hobbyists and scientists have started posting on their experience with what, what maximizes the cavitation process, what can you do with the apparatus of your electrolysis uh, equipment to maximize the cavitation process. And this is one of them. Um, he says that you, you uh, sort of make rough electrodes by doing a certain process and that really maximizes the cavitation process giving rise to more secondary gas rather than the Brown's gas um, and uh, this is his equipment um, you can use people have used mechanical vibration like um, Omasa in Japan uh, and uh, he's he's done it with these conditions he actually managed to uh, accidentally store the gas for about two years and he came back into his lab and uh, he could still light it and got energy out of it. So it, it, it's stable for a very long time if it is un, uh, under certain conditions. And uh, he said that uh, usually when my electrolysis equipment was making more of the secondary gas, uh, it was a lot of cavitation was going on then, then white, white smoke was generated, which was a sign of um, a lot of cavitation, a lot of turbulence. Electric uh, fields oscillating electric fields and pulsed waveforms, just uh, um, pulsing it with high voltage frequencies has been observed to uh, produce cavitation and uh, there are examples of that, patterns showing that. Um, ultrasonic vibrations uh, and um, this, is, this is one electrolysis effect that uh, was observed in Wisconsin. And there are examples where uh, you know, an improvement was made by cavitating and charging it electrically. And uh, there are different 
ways to do it. People have uh, written about it in scientific and uh, other lit uh, you know patent literatures. So uh, this was what I wanted to point out to the re the reentrant jet of the bubble as it collapses abruptly gives rise to uh, what is theorized to be this this new form of water. It's a water crystal uh, which stabilizes and forms. Um, Meta structures which can which can be stable and then you know you can either with an electric charge you you turn it into a plasmoid which uh, shows large amount of kinetic energies you can uh, think of putting it in an engine to drive a piston or you can uh, light it and uh, it burns uh, and turns back into water and and this water crystal uh, has. Well, this is uh, another MIT prof who photographed his plasmoids. He, he saw effects where um, he would, his system was pretty simple. He had a water container with a weight, and he would spark the water with uh, high voltage. And there would be an explosion in the water. He would see these plasmoids throwing the weight up, blowing his apparatus. And so there was a lot of excessive energy, much more than what he put in. Um, uh, and he, he has written about it, too. Uh, there, there were other people who studied this through different me uh, mechanisms, basically studied the fact that a lot more energy than can be accounted for was being seen. Um, sonoluminescence is another phenomenon which is, uh, which is now widely known, um, where you form through laser excitation or uh, some uh, ultrasonic excitation. Uh, you have uh, cavitation bubbles of um, gases, inert gases forming in water, and they, they r collapse back abruptly with very high temperatures inside. They, they can go beyond 10,000 uh, Kelvin, and you, can see, you, you see a bright light coming out of uh, it as the bubble collapses. And that is uh, um, Jul uh, Julian Schwinger, I think, was the physicist who said, who was the first one to say that this is zero-point energy uh, manifestation. This cannot be explained in any other way. Um, the, the bubble. In, in case of sonoluminescence, it, it's, it can be anywhere, but in, in cavitation, uh, which produces a large uh, extraction of zero-point energy, the bubbles are usually formed near a surface in the equipment, and the reentrant jet uh, of the collapsing bubble uh, forces huge amounts of pressures. It could be, it could be half a million uh, PSI uh, has been observed and very high uh, temperatures. And that is what is uh, causing the new the, the uh, form of water that we saw. Um, uh, Macroionic water crystal, they call it. And uh, it, it, it shows lots of different um, energetic behavior. If, if there are um, trenches observed in very high melting ceramic material. So this crystal basically, it, it, it forms. And it, it shoots out with such uh, a huge force that it just carves trenches into uh, metals, into very high uh, melting point ceramics, aluminum oxide, whatever is present. And um, uh, it, it self accelerates. It, it, it accelerates to very, very high speeds, almost uh, ultrasonic speeds. And um, it shows, it, it bores craters into uh, materials that are present there. And uh, Marc Leclerc uh, recently, from one of his experiments, has uh, even uh, claimed transmutation of elements. And I, was, I really did not believe it to start with. But there are three different independent laboratories in America which have now confirmed this, um, that with just a little bit of water um, causing the right amount of cavitation, he, he basically engineers his cavitation in a certain way uh, which he hasn't shared yet. There are patterns, but they don't exactly describe the process. Um, but he's creating cavitation bubbles with reentrant jets, which, which gives, uh, give rise to so much uh, force that uh, it creates temperatures which cause fusion and transmutation of elements, and obviously a lot of excessive energy. These are, uh, these are some of the photographs of the element. He found all the elements uh, of the periodic table from his experiments, which is really unbelievable. Um, and, but there are more, more than three labs now that have confirmed it. So just with a simple cavitation water experiments, he's, he's 
cre he created chips of uh, different elements, my, um, gram size chips, which is very fascinating. So uh, zero point energy um, extraction is causing transmutations and is causing uh, temperatures high enough to cause fusion. He, there is a lot of data that I have if, uh, if anyone here is interested in you know, uh, confirming because there are, there are uh, specific temperature rises uh, associated with fusion and so on. So we, the, all the data is out there. Um, in plasma as well, we saw in water, in, in plasma, um, Ken Shoulders is one of the guys who, who designed a simple experiment where he would shoot off, uh, he, he would just basically let off a small um, discharge of voltage in plasma and he would see, um, he, he called them um, electron validum because he, did not he d didn't know what they were, but they were basically boring a hole in his witness plate with so, uh, a lot of force. Uh, sure, okay, I'll, uh, I'll just skip over this. This is just his system. Um, they, they saw that no matter what the size of these uh, objects was, the, the electron, the, the charge to mass ratio always sort of uh, settled down to a, uh, somewhere near an electron and contains uh, all these cases that contain excessive energy which just cannot be accounted for except for the zero point energy field and these are the uh, photographs. These are the anomalies, basically. Um, summary, there, there is now a lot of evidence that systems in certain conditions cohere to the zero point field, um, and vacuum is, is everywhere. So this, this source is pretty much everywhere, and, and it, it's going to be our creativity, what we do with it. Uh, we, we need to control the conditions to extract it. So far, it's just been violent forces. We need to figure out uh, how to just extract heat, uh, keep it safe. Um, in future work, mechanisms really need to be studied, which I think uh, w academic research needs to be encouraged to do that, because so far, it's private companies doing the research and you know venture capitalists, and um, they mostly are not. They don't care about the mechanism. They just want to sell the energy. Uh, I would like to thank people who, uh, whose work I have presented here. Moray is a, uh, Moray King has written extensively three books on zero point energy. Nassim Haramein is a physicist in Hawaii uh, who came up with the unification um, law. Uh, Mark Leclerc is the one who really uh, who has p uh, patented the data but has put it all out there about the the. Uh, the structure of the water crystal and so on, and the, the forces that is C with cavitation, and all the other scientists and people who work on it who have shared information uh, which I could present here, and Hadi and Milin who have supported my work here and have tolerated my, um, you see, uh, everything else. Every, everything that I do except for work here, they tolerate it, uh, so thank you for that. Do you have time for questions? Oh. Um, great. Shoot. OK. <laughs> yes, Heidi. There are two things that I want to talk about. If, if we can just do one of them, that would be great. Sure. So I don't know which one would be easier for everyone to participate in. Um, the type of transmission element, what do we see there? Usually, transmutations uh, happen uh, in very high temperature and pressure environments. So you, you see nucleosynthesis in stellar, at stellar temperatures in, in, on the surface of the sun or uh, at the center of the sun or you know, in, in supernova. Yes. Right? I suppose fusion happens. Yeah, supernovae. Right, right supernovae. Right. right. So. Right. In normal fusion, yeah. Fusion. Yeah, yeah. And then all the elements beyond iron are made where? Supernova. supernova. Nowhere else has, have they been, except for this experiment here, nowhere else have they been. So if I'm trying to do this in the lab, the suggestion is that I'm creating supernova conditions. Microscopic supernova conditions. Uh, and so, and, and, and more precisely, am I achieving in doing that? Uh, 
uh, fusion. What you mean? Fusion of heavier elements which don't occur anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah, I have the data. I can share it with you. Absolutely. No, no. The, all the spectra, all the uh, radioactive um, assessments, everything, it's all there. That's right. That's right. You create extremely high pressures and temperatures, yeah. That's the only condition it works in. Well, at least as far as we know. Unless it's seeded. Seeded. Yeah. In, uh, I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, how do you explain formation of every element in the uh, table? with just water and PVC and aluminum. H how? No, no, but I'm the... About I don't know how you could scan this, because how do you get chips, gram-sized, most That's of... The part I'm having the most trouble with. Me too. No, these were gram-sized so chips. That's when, that's when it becomes incredible. And, and it's you, incredible at the atomic level. You, you know, right. At the, at the scale of chips, it's then it begins to look like I went to the chemistry shop in Boston. And most of the uh, elements uh, that were heavier elements were seen embedded in a, in a uh, diamond coating. So they made diamond. They made diamond. Mm -hmm. Not yet. <laughs> you know why I'm so skeptical, right? Uh, I, so am I. But how do you uh, how do you challenge data that comes out of the oh, University of Maine? Right. Yes. I think heat would be the simplest thing we could do. We can get uh, ex generate excess heat and just use that. And there are lots of. Uh, you mean investment in technologies that we can already, we know and control over this? Sure, I think. It can be, for sure. So it's not just an advantage, it's an asset. Well, that's the problem. The, the greed that comes with the promise of abundant, cheap energy is, is what is causing, I think, is really blocking the, the, pro, uh, the progress in the field because no one wants to look at fundamental mechanisms. Everyone wants to just do a reaction and make energy and sell it. <laughs> I, I'd like to study the mechanism.
No, I think all sorts of perspectives exist, right? People have preferences to what, yeah. But um, yeah, usually what Milin says, when you see a very high density energy, which is everywhere, um, NASA's invested in it. No, of course, lots of private people invest in it, in, have been investing in it, yes. Um, uh, sorry, is that it? Yeah. Empty space, right? Black hole radiation. It's it's just unbelievably fascinating yeah. about you know. What's different about this approach to this yeah. is that actually to flip the whole picture around, we are the anomalous tiny thing outside of this exactly. incredibly massive thing. And in, in a sense, we are all the XAP from the black hole. Right? Everything that you see around us is the XAP from the black hole. And yeah, right. pretty much, pretty much. But we are 1% matter, all matter in the universe is about 1%, the rest of it is this. Our equations have been telling us that for 100 years. And uh, about black holes, you should read, I'll pass on some papers to you. The, the energy density that we observe, 10 to the 94, uh, is enough to make Every uh, every elementary particle a black hole. Well, no question about that. So protons are black holes, yeah, electrons are black holes. E right, and and there is a whole new mathematics coming out trying to explain this. Safety risks. Sure, I think I if. If you know we did not control it, then we can have fusion going on, which you, which is unless you were trying to do fusion, you did not, you don't want it happening. <laughs> so absolutely. Yes. Otherwise, you can. But there are safe ways to do it. There are safe ways to do it, to answer your question. If you, if you engineer your cavitation system uh, in such a way that it, it happens at a very small scale, it doesn't create the kind of pressures and temperatures that give rise to the reentrant jet and so on, then you can just, something like Brown's gas, right? If you, if you engineer your system to just make those stable uh, meta charge clusters, then you, just, you, you can ignite it and use the heat. And it turns back into water, and that's it. So that is the extreme end of the, where the technology can go. He, uh, Mark Leclerc was engineering his cavitation bubbles to be extremely large. He was using lasers to cavitate. And he was, he was um, channeling the reentrant jets in a very specific way to create what he did. 
if you didn't do that, if you just had simple charge cluster, water gas charge clusters, you just use it to uh, heat, create heat. That's it. Yes. They're the same thing, the same phenomenon. You, you, you know that, right? Uh, 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 what, um, so blades, propellers, uh, metals, wherever cavitation, in engineering systems, cavitation is a problem, yeah. right? Because it bores holes into uh, even the metals and, and it creates drag and uh, engineers try to actually create a system where there's minimum cavitation possible. But this is just the opposite. Well, you try to create a system which maximizes cavitation and engineer it in such a way that you can channel it. Well, what I was trying to do was to uh, just create a context where vacuum has, is not empty. It, it's got a certain density and it's everywhere. That was basically the context. And uh, what you see in cavitation is the vacuum inside the atoms of the water or in a gas or plasma, or whatever, wherever the cavitation bubble is happening. You see the vacuum, the energy from that vacuum uh, being extracted. It doesn't have to be, it, it could be any size. The vacuum is, well, m as I said, most atoms are 99.99% vacuum, right? So the energy is in, inside those atoms. That's right. Sound travels faster and, and the denser the medium, right? Yeah. Cavitation is the collapse. The cavitation bubble collapses and that's that collapse is where the energy starts uh, coming in. The electrons don't get released. The electrons, there are extra electrons created. They are embedded within the, the new structure that forms, the water crystal that forms. The zero. Uh, I don't quite get the question, but I think you. So you're saying that you you we see extra electrons. Mm -hmm. and they're going somewhere. They are. They stay within the system, as long as the system is stable. If the system, if you make the system manifest, uh, I don't know, kinetic energy, for example, by shooting the jets, mm -hmm. then ultimately um, that energy will dissipate. Mm -hmm. So I, do, I don't know the answer to that. But I think um, from what I've been reading uh, about the theoretical backgrounds is that the zero point energy fields, as they contribute to the extra energy, uh, some of it manifests in form of elementary particles. Hmm? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if every time it has to be an electron positron pair. Or if, um, I, I really don't know actually. I wish I knew that side of the physics. I don't know. 
Yeah. I'd like to find out for sure.